Thank you very much. Uh, so our last reader, uh, Octavio Solis, uh, has written more than 20 plays, and as well as a great memoir, uh, Retablo Stories from a Life Lived Along the Border. Uh, his latest play, Quixote Nuevo, will be featured at the Roundhouse Theater in Bethesda in September. His plays have been produced in theaters across the country, including the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, the California Shakespeare Theater, the Yale Repertory Theater, Denver Center for the Performing Arts, the Magic Theater, and El Teatro Campesino. Octavio received the United States Artist Fellowship and the Penn Center USA Award for Drama. Octavio, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. I'm going to be reading from my book, Retablos. Uh, it's the only book of prose I have, uh, rather than to share some, uh, some excerpts from my plays, because it's just easier. Uh, I have to say, though, before I start, how deeply honored I am to be among this company of writers. It's the, the work I have heard today, this afternoon, is just astonishing. It's really, it's really powerful. And uh, I'm very moved to be uh, listed among these new inductees. So thank you very much for sharing. And also to be in this wonderful murderer's row of writers, all with Texas in their bones. It's just really an honor. So thank you. Uh, I'm going to read one called El Mero Mero. It, it's a sort of story. Um, and so I'll just, just get to it. El Mero Mero. What the hell is a man anyway? I had a clear sense of what that whole deal meant when I was a little mocoso, when everyone was older and taller and deeper voiced than me and kept the modelo negro at arm's length. But now I'm growing some fine hair on my lip and my balls my voice is dropping and my flared jeans are all high waters. I'm an easy target for my buds at the schoolyard. When's the flood coming, S.A.? It doesn't help that over my platform shoes, I'm often wearing white tube socks. Girls are kind of not into that. Clearly, I'm missing something. But my jefe, my old man, my father, he's a man. He's got the forearms to prove it. He's modeled his squint after Charles Bronson and put spicier chile on his eggs than anyone in our house. He busts his ass slinging burgers over spitting grease nine hours a day for us and doesn't ever complain about it. Then he comes home a drained man dropping all the trappings of his day into the top drawer of his dresser before he drags himself into the shower. That's where all the talismans of manhood are kept. Right now, he's not home. My mother is snoring on the couch while the six o'clock news blasts out of the Magnavox. Everyone else is either out or out of sight. It's like some muse of my adolescence is saying, here's your chance, baboso. Peering into his drawer, I take inventory of the tokens that make dad, dad. His thin of pomada de la campana, some cologne in a boot-shaped bottle, shoe polish for his work oxfords, a few ragged pesos, tangles of man bracelets, old watches and chains, random pens collected from various customers, old keys, a pack of camels, an engraved silver lighter, and a single copper-headed bullet. These are the trinkets of my dad's personal mythology, all jumbled together with the carelessness of a working man. Recalling how he applies the pomada on his friar grease burns, I rub some on my hands and douse my neck and face with his cologne, which burns into my raw pimples. I slick my hair back with his hair cream. Then I put the cross that he keeps on a gold chain around my neck, unbuttoning my paisley shirt down to my sternum so it shows. Then try on one of his dead watches. Finally, I look at the structure of my new self in the mirror. El mero mero, the real real. El mero mero slinks out of the house and goes around to that derelict field where the cotton used to grow to shoulder height. He leans against the wall by the sear clumps of tumbleweed and breathes in his newfound musk. He looks down at the cross catching the sun down light. He rattles the bracelet around his skinny wrist as he raises a cigarette to his lips and lights it with his beautiful lighter. 
Oh, the sound of that lighter. Suppressing a cough, he looks out toward the blue-gray silhouette of the mountains in Ciudad Juarez, where he imagines all the real men of the world are nodding their somber heads in unison at the spectacle of his arrival. El mero mero. A group of three slouchy vatos in white t-shirts and baggy khakis, old enough to drive a car but not old enough to own one, stroll down the street on their way to some place better than where they were. And Mero Mero turns his gaze their way and they must feel it because one of them looks right back at him and sneers, Que ves puto? And Mero Mero looks away and that's when he hears them laughing. Not even very loud, not even with much derision, just the kind of laughter that diminishes a guy. The kind of laughing that flattens the sunset and puts it out of reach and causes all the fine hairs of a person like El Mero Mero to wish themselves onto some other body, not his. Little flecks of shame and anger swarm over him and he doesn't even finish the camel. And Mero Mero knows he'll slink back inside and put his old man's bracelet and cross his crumpled pack of cigs and silver lighter back in the drawer, and he'll wash off the pomada and cologne in the shower, along with everything that makes him el mero mero. Except that in the little pocket of my high water flare jeans that I'll wear for another humiliating month, in a year of humiliating months, I'll keep a shiny copper-headed bullet for the day when I understand the real real. So there's that one. Wow. I am glad I'm recording this. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. Uh, here's another one. This is the first time I've read this one before. I've been embarrassed about it, but I had a, a company in San Francisco called uh, Word for Word. Uh, they're a marvelous company. They perform works of fiction, short works of fiction, word for word, without cutting or deleting or adapting any text. They do it as written, and they perform it fully staged with lights, sets, costumes, and it's wondrous. It's really a wonder to behold. And they've done authors living and dead, uh, contemporary and, and, uh, and ancient as well. Uh, and I was honored to have them stage some of my stories. And this was one of them. And I was surprised that it worked. So I'm gonna read it right away. It's a short one. It's called El Judío. I don't even know what Judío means. I thought it was his name. El judío, my dad would say to my mom. I viene el judío. Here comes the Jew. But what is a Jew? I never saw one before. I never heard that word before except in reference to Christ, king of the Jews. I thought it meant he was like Jesus. Three of my friends are named Jesus, and they aren't half as good as the one in the Bible by a long shot. In fact, one of them shoots birds out of the mimosa trees with his BB gun for the pleasure of it, and that seems completely the opposite of Jesus. But something about the way my parents say the word, el judío, makes him seem special and, and sanctified, a man with the kind of spiritual dimension that demands his name be uttered in hushed tones. The Jew is coming today. Have you got enough for the Jew? El judío is at the door. One morning, I'm watching cartoons on the TV and the picture is flipping like crazy and the vertical hole doesn't work and my bladder is telling me to march in place before I pee myself in my pajamas. I hear a knock on the door and I open it. Standing real close to the screen door is a tall, ruddy-faced man wearing a golf shirt with some design on the pocket. And at the base of his corpulent neck is a gold chain with a little star on it. He runs his hand through his short reddish hair and good-humoredly asks, Esta papa? My mom and dad are in the bedroom reading the paper while my brother and my sister fight over the comics. All of them sprawled on the same bed in what is our Sunday morning ritual. But out here, it's me and the man's benevolent smile. I like his watch, gleaming like a holy relic. I like his blue eyes, squinting against the sun to peer into the dark of our house. I tell him to wait and I turn around and shout over the TV, Mom! Dad! El judío! He blinks and blanches a little, never letting the smile teeter off his face. And then I see my mom come rushing out to grab me by the wrist 
and pull me into the kitchen with a mortified look. Then my dad, yanking his pants on and counting out some cash, takes my place at the door. A few words and a couple of bills are exchanged, my dad ending the whole thing with an earnest and apologetic gracias, both of them incapable of letting their eyes meet. Don't ever call him that, they tell me. That's not his name. His name is Senor Rubinsky. You got that? Malgriado. But that's what you call him, I protest. I hear you calling him the Jew all the time. That's none of your business, they fire back. He's Senor Rubinsky to you, David Rubinsky. Entiendes? It turns out that David Rubinsky has loaned my dad some money to get him through our tough times. He's borrowed money from him for Christmas too, so we can get the bikes we plead and pray for. In fact, Senor Rubinsky has given countless low interest loans to the many struggling Mexicans in the greasy spoon business and beyond. The local banks don't trust our dads much during these recession days. Why should they? When these so-called unaccountables might just default and disappear over the border. The loans of El Judío are the difference between making the house payment or not, buying groceries or not, getting new clothes for school or not. Whatever they say behind his back, their gratitude for his service is deep and authentic. He's well regarded among these families. When he dies, they will come to his funeral, their cars lined up for miles to pay their respects to him. It's ironic that all my varied and valued experiences with Jewish people began with the most pernicious stereotype, but we were stereotypes then too. Poor backwater Mexicans who had to borrow against their own futures to realize them. The following week, He's at the door again. This time, he's wearing a paisley tie over a damp white shirt. I meet him at the door and politely say, Mr. Rubinsky. His ruddy complexion turns redder still and he looks at me like he's stung more by this salutation than by what I said the week prior. But then he pulls up his chin and confers on me the thinnest, drollest smile. Tell your papa that El Judío is at the door. <laughs> wow, that's oh, great. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. That's cool. No más, Octavio? Hmm? No oh, more? Uh, I, I think anything else, I'll take too much time. I, I've taken enough. Thank you. That was great. That was wonderful. So anyway, I'm, I'm thrilled that all of you got to hear these five new members. Um, I think it, you know, and just seeing your faces, frankly, I feel like I'm not so far away from Texas um, tonight. All right. And so I, I also feel energized like Octavio, just hearing these five new members read, just the stunning work.